So everyone is here. Thank you very much. So um, welcome to our January Information Exchange meeting, the first one for this year. Um, we will be talking about London Ambulance Services. Our speakers will be talking about London Ambulance Services and their plans for the next five years. Um, before we start the meeting, I would like to uh, ask you two questions. I've got these four questions here. I hope you don't mind me launching them now. Very short questions. Um, the first one is, have you used the ambulance services in the last five years? Apart from you, Ed, <laughs> uh, and the rest of you guys. Okay, so good. One said yes, and three out of four said no. Thank you. Everyone voted. I guess they did. Yes, thank you. And the second question, I guess it will be relevant to the person who said yes. Will be, I'll share results with you here now. And then my next poll question will be this one. Were you satisfied with the treatment received? Yes, perfect. I mean, this is a good outcome. Thank you very much. And 100% so far. Yes. <laughs> results? Yes, good. Thank you very much uh, for sharing your um, quick outcome of the experience. Thank you. So without really um, taking so much of your time, Roger, if I can pass the word to you now, I will let you introduce yourself. Um, and after your presentation, I'm sure there will be questions to come from the public or from those who attend the meeting today. Is that okay? That's absolutely fine. Excellent. Thank you very much. Over to you then. Um, thank you. Yeah. So, hi everyone. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Roger Davidson. Um, my job title is Director of Strategy and Transformation, at, and I'm at the London Ambulance Service NHS Trust. Uh, and the reason uh, for this conversation today is to try and get input from yourselves on what should be the priorities for LAS over the over the coming um, up to five years. We're re-preparing our, rewriting our strategy for the period 2023 to 2028. Uh, you'll all appreciate an absolutely crucial period as we emerge hopefully from COVID and uh, into the next phase of the development of the NHS with lots of questions about its performance. And we're right at the centre of all of that. I'm joined by two colleagues. Uh, can I ask you to introduce yourselves, my two uh, colleagues, uh, Victoria and Ed? Hello, um, my name is Victoria and I'm working with the strategy team to write the um, strategy for the next five years. Hi there, my name's Ed. I'm um, an advanced paramedic and I'm working in the field of urgent care and I've been brought onto the strategy team to bring a clinical input into the development of the strategy. Great, um, and uh, we hope, hope as we go through this discussion, and I do want it to be a discussion with input, comments from yourselves, um, not, not a Q and A as such, I'm very happy to do as much Q and A as you want to, but I'd love to get a feel for what you think is important. That's what we're really trying to get from this, from this conversation. So comments, controversial statements, um, anything you feel about LAS, all of that is totally welcome. Uh, any experience you've had, good or bad, um, are welcome, and uh, and and so so that we can, and and it's great that we've got Victoria and Ed here. Ed obviously uh, is a frontline one of our um, frontline practicing clinicians out there on the streets of London every day, uh, providing care to the people of the city, uh, and so and, and he can I, I'm sure enlighten you as to on some some of the ways that. A system actually works in practice. Um, so Roger, I'm going to, yeah. Roger, sorry. I'm sorry. Would you like me to put your presentation on? Yes, if that's if that's all right. So hopefully, yeah. going to somebody going to drive the side. So what I thought I'd do is talk with, in the spirit of trying to make this conversation. I am going to hit you with a few slides. Forgive me for that, um, but just to structure some input. I'm not going to dwell on all of these. Um, so I might just sort of spin through them because I want to get to the conversation as as quickly as possible but are we up for just a few slides just on some of the context just to help people get people's brain in gear is that useful 
Can you see this well? Can everyone see my? Yep, perfect. You just let me know when you want me to change. Okay, it. so let's spin on to the next one. That's just the content slides. Let's spin on to the next one. So this slide just gives you a bit of a sense of the scope of London Ambulance. I don't know how much you all know about it, but uh, you'll see there that not only are we providing the 999 and emergency care service for the 9 million people that live across the city, um, out of hospital, pre-hospital urgent emergency care service, we're also the leading provider of 111 services, allowing us to, uh, to uh, make connections between those two services. And you can see there the number of calls coming in across those two services, more than 2 million a year coming into each of them. Um, we know that there are differences between the people calling those different numbers and, but, and, and only a relatively small proportion of people actually call both those numbers. Uh, we know that the, the people calling 111 tend to be younger uh, than the people calling 999. Um, and then you've got other things there. We're pretty good on, um, or have traditionally been pretty good on um, category one calls. That's our most, uh, the most, the, the, the strongest emergencies, life-threatening situations, which the regulations say we should seek to respond to in under seven minutes. And we're pretty good at that on a in in the, in the capital. Obviously, getting across busier streets, but in the uh, but uh, often shorter distances compared to our peer ambulance services in other parts of the country. Um, and we want to be a, an organisation that is really good to work for, um, that looks after our staff, that really values them, uh, offers great careers from apprenticeships through to um, the top end of the clinical profession. Uh, and we wanna be a service that looks like the people that we serve. Um, and uh, we're making some progress on all of these different fronts. Um, just a few other bits to tell you. We've got, uh, if you get looking at the scope of our service, there's about 10,000 of us staff wise, we include volunteers and we've got about 100 buildings across the capital, about 60, between 60 and 65 ambulance stations across the capital. Um, the crews that go out on their work are, will start and end their shift, um, but are going out normally 12 hour shifts, going out to see patients, but they don't normally go back very much between those patients once they go out the road, they're off out and about. We've got 999 centres operating at um, Waterloo and Newham, and 111 centres at Croydon and Barking, so big centres, big, big centres for us. Um, and you know, we're obviously at the cutting edge of everything that really that's gone on. I mean, I've, I've only been here a year, but it's been fascinating to see, you know, from relatively small but important major incidents in different parts of the city to the Queen's funeral, to the heat wave, to the recent snap of cold weather and winter, um, the, the number of different types of event that um, the return of Notting Hill Carnival, numbers of different types of event that the emergency services in this city have to respond to is really, really amazing. And um, uh, and I often think that's where we're at our best is in those situations when, uh, you know, backs up against the wall and we just have to do our best for patients across the city. And the um, so uh, fascinating array, array of work um, and the increasingly, I think, um, our clinicians are doing more at the scene, doing more for, the, more for their patients, perhaps the history of the ambulance services more of a sort of focus on transport, but I think we're much more now mobile clinicians moving around the city and increasingly doing more, providing more care on the phone as well as as, as well as face to face. So it just gives you a bit of a snapshot of the of the type of work that we are talking about. Can we go on to the next slide, please? This, this, I won't dwell on this one, but this just, we are a 111 provider. We bid for those contracts uh, across the city and uh, we are, we, we provide some 111 services in all of the five integrated care systems 
that constitute London now. Uh, and we are the main provider in the Northeast and the Southeast, uh, the lead provider in the Northwest. We have applied to be the lead provider in the North Central system, and we are part of the picture in the Southwest. But uh, the most, certainly the most significant provider of 111 services in the capital. And that's important because uh, it allows us to join up the emergency and urgent care bits of the system. So emergency, life-threatening, life-changing injuries, urgent care, much more focused on people needing, people with, with, an urge, with, with, a, with a pressing urgent need but doesn't fit into the, into the other category. And through 111, we can offer people advice, we can put them through to a clinician, we can put them into ongoing services. So it allows us to play a big role in joining up the urgent and emergency care system across the city. On to the next slide, please. I will, um, obviously you get plenty of opportunity to ask me questions and quiz all of this if you want to. So we wanna have a strategy that is really built on the needs of the people that we serve. Um, and um, we want to engage uh, widely across the city, and this is one part of that. We've invited every health watch in the capital and given them uh, and, and have helped to facilitate uh, their contributions. And we hope to get um, contributions from every borough in London if we possibly can. And also with our own teams and staff, with um, as I was describing earlier, we can be quite a fragmented organization. So we need to work really hard to make sure that we are reaching the front line and learning from and building on their experience in terms of how we devise the strategy of the organization. Next slide, please. Uh, the other thing is about join up. You know, we're London Ambulance Service is not an island and the, um, we are in, in, inextricably linked with so many other different parts of the system, the hospitals that we relate to, those hospitals with a &E departments, the, the mental health system, uh, the uh, care homes, uh, that we need to understand the mayor's priorities around health and equality and air, and air quality, um, and um, work really as a partner within the five integrated care systems that I was describing, and making sure we're contributing as a good partner to all of that we're, we're alongside the, 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 the broader effort. Um, next slide, please. I just want to show you a few little bits of data, uh, just a few. Um, uh, so one bit of data, and perhaps we could go on to the next slide, I think is a bit more interesting after this one, if I'm right. Yeah, so there is a link. You won't be surprised to hear me say this, but this, this slide, so there is a link between um, and things like ambulance call outs, how many calls we get per, um, per local area and, um, uh, and, and things like age and deprivation and income. And this, these thing, this is drawn out in, this, in these types of maps, which attempt to see, attempt to show you that yes, there is a link between where the populace is. So we get a lot of calls from the Westminster and very central London area during the day, for example. But there is very clearly a link between other us and other factors um, across the city. And that emphasizes, I think, our system responsibilities and the system response to dealing with these things. And often the ambulance service picking up the, um, the symptoms of some of, 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 of some of the issues that exist in our broader society. We can go to the next slide, please. We go to the next one. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, so um, so we skipped one there, but don't don't worry. That shows you that the number of calls we're getting is going up and up and up. Number of incidents we go to is roughly flat in actual fact over a period of time. So people are coming more and more to one 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 and nine 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 services on a on a pretty steep curve. But the number of incidents we're actually going to is broadly flat. And I think if we go on to the, um, so people are seeking cares in different ways, I suppose is the conclusion of that. If we go on to the next slide, uh, I think this tells you something else about who is calling. This, this slide is looking at people calling 999 and, uh, and who is in particular, think, looking at the question of how many times people call 999. 
and we've look, looked at who calls 999 more than five times in a year. And you can see there that about 22% of the overall demand on the 999 system is in fact uh, delivered. It comes from about 4% of the people who actually call us. So there was a group of patients who are calling us an awful lot. And I say that because um, I think that I want to distinguish that between very, very people who are using the system uh, uh, sort of in a very, very highly intense way. But I think what we're really seeing is people getting older, people getting sicker and needing the service more. But that also tells you that perhaps they need more help from other parts of the health and care system to satisfy their needs in a way that um, an ambulance uh, may not be able to. Um, so I think that's an interesting uh, reflection in that slide there, who's calling us um, on a regular basis. This one shows you that we're, 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 we are, in fact, reducing the number of people we take to hospital. In fact, around just under half of the people we go to, we actually take to hospital. The rest of them we um, look after in different ways. And an increasing number of people are dealt with by what we call hear and treat, which basically means they spoke to a clinician on the phone and that clinician was able to solve their problem in uh, or refer them to somebody else who could solve their specific problem. So, in, so fewer of, of all the people we go to, fewer people are in fact taken to hospital. Uh, we're doing a lot to divert patients away from the busiest hospitals to deal with things like handover delays and more patients are being looked after by clinicians over, over the phone. Next slide, please. So just trying to draw some of that together um, before we get into the discussion. Um, we've talked very, very widely with different groups of people to try and identify the key themes that we should be looking at. And I've got five. Um, so if we just go on to the next slide, these are they as sort of key priority areas for us. Um, so the first one, the thing that you actually fully expect London Ambulance to be doing, so improving the delivery of the emergency care services. That includes everything from making sure people are calling us appropriately to improving handover, delay, ha handover delays at hospitals, to making sure our clinical care is outstanding on heart attacks and strokes um, and, and anything else, a trauma and anything else that we have to, and, and anything else that we have, we, we have, to, we have to deal with. Um, preparing well for major incidents, I've referred to it. So all of that bucket of activity is there. Contributing to the second one, contributing to the urgent care system. And as I've described, using our role in 111 to support uh, uh, primary care and GPs in particular who are under, under real pressure um, and being a, a coordinator of care for those who need on the day services um, rather than uh, booked in services. And then being a really great employer for our fantastic staff who do so much every day, um, creating rewarding careers, making sure we've got good well-being uh, in place for people who are doing, not working long hours in very, very pressured environments, dealing with difficult things. And uh, so making sure that we are providing the right working environment for our people absolutely critical priority and one and the number and the first two priorities one and two are critically dependent on that um, we know the link between staff engagement and the quality of care is critical and then perhaps thinking about two other areas that are um, crucial we are as i said earlier we are part of integrated care systems we want to contribute to those objectives so for example what could, what role can we play on health inequalities um, we are in people's homes we are seeing we are maybe got called out for something but we can also see other things going on as well so we do many thousands of blood pressure checks for example uh, on the people of London every every day and uh, you know the can we do more to help spot cardiovascular disease before it gets um, worse for people, and maybe we can. And uh, so we want to think about how we play our role in the system. And finally, also how we 
contribute to what people refer to as the social determinants of health, i.e. all things outside healthcare that affect health, which in fact is about 80% of things. So um, by that I mean uh, we need uh, to play our part in making sure that London is a great place to live. So that means providing good employment, that uh, making sure that people are paid reasonably, that they're working in good environments, that we are that our fleet, our fleet of ambulances, we are a major polluter, that we are green, that we're moving electric, the way we use our buildings, the way we use other materials, plastic, for example, that we are contributing to life in London through all of those means. So that hopefully gives you a bit of a summary of the things that we're thinking about. And I'd love to have a conversation now with you all about whether or not these things, what I've said makes sense, or these things are resonating and what you would like to see us focused on. Thank you. I hope I didn't go on too long. No, you didn't, Roger. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Really um, very good things that you said. I'm sure that everyone appreciates the, the support uh, that is received by the local, by the London Ambulance Services crews. Because I recently run a, a focus group with a small group of Turkish speaking members of the, of, with the members of the Turkish speaking community. Um, and they all had um, long history of using ambulance services and they could actually compare what the service was five years ago and what the service is like today. Uh, and they had some useful recommendations, which will be obviously shared with you. Fantastic. Soon. Yes. Um, I don't have any questions, but I'm sure someone will. Any questions for Roger? Raise a few issues. Go on, Malcolm. Yeah. Hello. Uh, Malcolm Alexander is my name. Um, hi. hi. I mean, I just want to raise some issues of concern, actually, because um, one of the things which is happening with the LAS over the past of 18 months, two years, is the difficulty of getting information from them, performance data. So we used to get monthly performance data packs. And they gave very, I mean, you've seen them, very, very comprehensive data. Um, and now the LES refuses to, to provide them. And, and we've raised the issue numerous times. We, in fact, your chief executive has been to, uh, to our office in, in Hackney. Um, and other things, you know, for example, we used to get uh, data, performance data by borough, and we can't get hold of that data anymore. Which, and, and that's important for, from the public health point of view, because, you know, trying to, you, you were talking about, you know, uh, elderly people, but actually finding out, you know, what the performance is like borough by borough is, is, is very important for us to know. And, and also we used to hold, this is through the, the Patients Forum, we used to hold public meetings where patients would talk about their experiences of the LAS, for example, in relation to sickle cell. And now the LAS won't, won't attend those meetings anymore. And, and, and it's it's quite strange because they used to be a very open uh, organization, easy to communicate with, and now the, the very opposite is true. And I just wonder what's what's happened to the, the to the LAS in terms of its its willingness to communicate with the with the public. I mean, we've tried so many times to get the data from them, but they absent Daniel absolutely refuses to to share monthly data. The data is put onto the website on, onto your website. But it's but it's months out of date. We used to get it monthly. Now it's you know about I don't know three, four, five months, um, and it's very very difficult to read. So I think those just for now those are a couple of things which I think really concern me. You know that change of culture from very being a very open organisation to being a very closed one. Shall I come back on that one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So th thanks, thanks, Malcolm. Uh, and can I pay tribute to you for your because uh, I know that you've been involved in this organisation for a long time, and yeah, sure. uh, I, you know, probably know much more about it than I do. Um, but, but only yeah. since two thousand and three. <laughs> um, so, um, so we do publish um, regular performance data at our. Um, so I'm not quite sure which thing you're actually talking about it was it was a monthly data pack which had the category or the you know performance against the the, the four categories it had the handover data and it, and it used to go to the commissioners and it, it had lots of really valuable stuff in it and then they sort of say well you know the amount of data they're willing to hand out now is just absolutely minimal in fact in fact we made a statement to the london assembly because they're currently doing an 
uh, you know, they're doing an investigation, not an investigation, a, a performance review of the London Ambulance Service. And so yeah. we sort of raise that issue with them as well. But but so, I don't understand the difference. Um, so we 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 obviously we, we we do publish our performance data at our board meetings, um, and there is a comprehensive pack that we publish as part of that, which has uh, a very very an awful lot of data in it. Yeah, but it's very old. <laughs> it's months um, out of date. Months out of date. Right. Instead, um, of, instead of monthly performance packs. It goes which... up to just before Christmas time. I was looking, we were looking at it this morning. Um, so perhaps we could just pick this up because you've obviously got an expectation from something that um, uh, his, historically that... Uh, yeah, we've heard the data possible. for years, yeah. Uh, and um, the, um, uh, like I say, we, we do a, uh, we publish a performance report at all of our public board meetings, which are held six times a year. And there is a comprehensive set of data plus uh, an update on all of that information from the chief medical officer and the chief paramedic, um, drawing out any issues that emerge from that data. Um, so uh, that that's that's kind of how we are doing that at the moment. And I think um, I don't to be honest know exactly the frequency but it would be at least every every two months because that's how it's, it's, it's older than that and, and also your current data has got no borough based organization in uh, data in it yeah but anyway, i mean we, i don't want to go over and over it but you know it's very clear that there is there was the, the month we've got monthly data and now the data is several months old all i'm saying is there's been a, a recent i don't think sort of press it it's just that it's it's you think it's been a culture change i i, I hear what you're saying I'm, which, not, I'm not trying which, to yeah i mean it, to, in uh, terms of strategy i think openness it, it looks like the las is hiding data uh, it, for example the 50 minute handover in a and e suddenly disappeared in your data set and was replaced by a 30 minute handover so your your fifty minute handover is contractual. Your thirty minute is is beyond that, and then one one hour plus data also disappeared. So I'll I'll stop there. But I just I just think openness should be part of the strategy. I think that's really important. Okay, so um, I would agree that openness should be part of our strategy. Fully fully agree and support that. And um, that that's not a not 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 a question. Um, and what what data one reports and what is most relevant. Is is a is a is a is a is a slightly different one. Um, we we'll have to recognise that we are working as part of five integrated care systems, of course. But that doesn't necessarily mean that borough data is irrelevant. In fact, the um, if you look oh, at um, the health deprivation issues that I was highlighting exactly. earlier, yeah. um, the one thing we can see from that studying that information is that the differences that are um, possible to see uh, are on very local areas are not visible when you go up to borough level exactly uh, because yeah. it smooths it out um so um uh, uh, that, that said there is also um a relationship with the ICSs which one wants to say this is the performance in each ICS as well as the kind of primary thing so let's but let's let's pick up some of the details of that so i i um my my background um is very much on the transparency end of this um and that's my personal history and uh, so i'm a personal advocate of that and the uh, and that will feature in the strategy okay and the other issue was you know we used to get groups of patients together in public meetings talking about their experience of the las but now um the LES won't provide speakers for those sort of meetings. So you want to hold one on, on epilepsy. Well, again, and, be... and I wrote to Fenella to ask her if she'd come along, doesn't even reply. Well, well again... I think this is a good, this is a meeting that gives a good example that, uh, a good example that can actually happen. Malcolm. Yeah. So, so, so on this one, so one thing that we, again, we definitely want to include in our, in our strategy is a strength and focus on understanding the experience of patients, both generally and specifically uh, around things like health inequality. Um, so uh, we haven't devised the best method of doing that, but I think um, everyone is committed to making that happen. 
And so, um, uh, and I think that could be everything from the experience of as a service of something like 111 to what happens in the back of an ambulance to, you know, looking at, uh, uh, at care pathways, for example, and then also looking at particular patient groups. Now, there's only, uh, we, we, as you know, have a patient and public council that advises our organisation. Um, but I think it's definitely the case that we need to do more to understand the, um, the, what, the experience of our patients as I say, both generally and specifically, yeah. and that was something we will include, and we're to and I'm totally open to a conversation with you and others and all of Health Watches in London um, uh, about how we do that best. Okay. Well, just, I'll just finish off one simple. Yeah. Just sorry, I'm just going to because we have two I'll more. Very, but I'll be very quick. We want to hold a meeting about epileptic seizures. And we've invited Fenella to come along to the meeting to talk about, to meet people with epilepsy to talk about that. And she hasn't replied. So here's an example. You know, yeah. the only reason we do this is to get the voice of, of the patient over to the LAS in, yeah. in, in a very detailed fashion. So I'll stop. I won't say anything. Let's split that up. Other people so, come in. But I, I think it's an example. Just make a note of that point about yeah. epileptic seizures. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you, Malcolm. Problem, Malcolm. Thank you. OK. Uh, great point to bring. Thank you for your challenges, by the way. Yeah, sort of really, really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, Malcolm. Logic, shall we go with you next now? Logic, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Yeah, it's Logi. Yeah, yeah. Logi. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm from a uh, um, Modern Health Watch. And uh, thanks for the presentation. What I'd like to find out the last slide you showed. The way I see it is LAS are taking more jobs rather than doing LAS job. You know, is I'm right to say that, like um, housing, deprivation, helping people out, is that, that part of LAS job in the future, five years like that? Am I right to say that? So, say it again. The... No, the, 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 the last slide showed that there's a lot of seem to be LAS going to get, take more responsibility of looking after their patients rather than um, doing the actual. Uh, LAS work. That's why I'm a bit confused on that one. And also now with the um, virtual wards coming up and more technology. Oops. Yeah. So right. the, are you are you referring there to bullets four and five? Is that what you mean? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So what we mean? I think it's just important to be clear what we mean by those things. Um, so five uh, is. You know, if you think about us as an organisation that spends £600 million a year, uh, that, as I say, has employees uh, uh, or has volunteers, 10,000 people, and has about 100 buildings across the... So we, have, we are a contributor to the way that London is, and uh, we want to recognise that and think about, think, have carefully about how about how we contribute so for example do we how much of that money do we spend in london uh can we do anything more to make sure that our buildings are for example open or available for use by community groups might be another way uh, other range of different things that we want to think about are green of the the pollution that is put out by our vehicles and the impact on health inequality and then on asthma so they we, we want to think that carefully we're not pretending that we are the answer to those problems but we feel that as an organ as we all as individuals and as an organization we do have a role to play to be responsible in those areas and um and we and we want to do that but don't get me wrong i'm not saying we can solve all of those problems we're just recognizing that we are an actor in the in this in the way that it is as well as as much as anybody else. Yeah, what about what about number four? What about number four? I mean, yeah. you're trying to help the patient. If you if LAS go to a house and if they see that house needs a um, lot of work to be done, I mean, it's all clutter, uh, holding. Will they be helping them out, or are they going to report the social services? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. So. 
Perhaps I could just bring my colleague Ed into this into into this conversation. So yes, yeah, so that's a kind of safeguarding question there, isn't yeah. it, about hoarding and that sort of stuff. So hello there. Hi. Just give a bit of a sense of what of how you deal with that in in real life, Ed. Yeah, no, absolutely. So that um, that is something that LAS is well placed to recognise. But uh, in that in that exact situation, that would be um, uh, we would. Uh, be passing that to social services so um, obviously we get a, a great insight into people's houses you know being invited in to help them in a time of need and that's one of the things that we and we train our crews to look for is, is situations that um, could escalate so cluttering clutter is a is a big one um, obviously it can cause falls it can cause fires um, so we have a criteria, we actually have a clutter index of, uh, you know, how cluttered a house is. Uh, and if, it, if, it's, uh, if it's very concerning, then we would pass this to show social services as a, as a possible sort of safeguarding issue, especially if it's flats and, and um, not, not a detached building, because they, you know, obviously it has a, an impact on other people in, in, in uh, the vicinity. So, th so that's not something that LAS would deal with specifically, but we would pass it, we wouldn't ignore it, we would pass it to the relevant um, agency. Now, the, um, now with the, sorry, with the... Um... Very quickly, Doggy. Yeah, yeah. Now with the issue of virtual wards and more IT technologies coming up, and people are trying to stop people going to the hospitals. How much training LA has got for having a new use of new technology? Um, shall I say a few words? Yeah, I mean, I, I can talk you through uh, my perspective as a clinician. So. Um, I met, I introduced myself at the start, but um, my, my exact job role is that I'm an advanced paramedic uh, and my speciality is in urgent care. So that's things like uh, minor injuries, minor illness. Um, we're able to bring a much greater service to people's houses. Um, so there is a focus within LAS to um, address a lot of uh, minor injuries and minor illness that we are dispatched to. Um, there's a lot of uh, sort of political reasons for why we attend a lot of minor injuries and illness, which I won't get into, but LAS are um, meeting that head on to try and cope with these pressures. Um, so just as I know you asked about technology, but just very briefly, uh, so my team specifically will bring things like antibiotics uh, for common infections, we can do wound closure for elderly people who might, you know, who we recognise there's a risk to take them to accident emergency, infections, falls, all these sort of things. We, I think we all understand that if we can treat people in their own homes, it's preferable. So that's what we're trying to address with the urgent care team. In terms of technology, um, we, from our control room, we have access to everyone's patient records with their consent if we're talking to them. So that helps us. We don't have to ask all the things again about the medications you're on and um, your background, medical history. In, in your house, I have an iPad, which is also connected to the NHS spine. So with, again, with your consent, I can look at your patient records and that'll help me to make a better decision about the treatment that's required today. Um, some people also have a, um, um, uh, request, uh, sorry, uh, when they're approaching the end of life, um, people can specify the, their wishes and that I would be able to access that as well to better meet people's uh, needs uh, as they're approaching the end of life as well. I hope I answered your question there. Well, yeah, thank you, thank that. you. Can I go, add a couple, so, so one, one thing that I think is uh, important for us to bear in mind is how, how the system joins up uh, because um, you know, as I said earlier, uh, half, if, 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 about half our patients we go to, we don't take to hospital. And if you go to hospital, the GP will, the, the hospital will write to the GP saying, this is, uh, this is what happened. But if the ambulance crews go out, that, won't, that process won't happen. And, and, that, and we, as I say, we take about 800,000 um, blood pressure checks across the capital every year. We do about 700,000 um, blood sugar checks across the capital every year. So these are massive numbers, and uh, you know, and that's just just gives you a bit of an illustration. If we could join up this information, where and, it, and then and then and then also other observable things such as you know, we that uh, we we might be able to help look look after patients in a more 
holistic way uh, and allow the health and care system to, in the phrase, be more connected to itself. And um, that's kind of, so that's, that's one sort of idea. Another bit on technology is uh, uh, paramedics have long said that they are the one clinical profession that cannot see what happens to their patients because they take them to hospital and they don't see the actual outcome. And that makes it hard for reflective practice to occur. And uh, so did I do the right thing? I've made this judgment about this individual, but what actually happened? after I took them to a &E. So we are um, working with an, on an experiment in Southeast London, which we hope to spread to other parts of the capital, whereby uh, paramedics would be able to see what ha happened in a, in, a, in a safe and confidential way, what happened to their patients and, and be able to reflect on whether or not they did the right thing um, and whether or not they need to improve anything. And that also allows you to allows the system to look at whether we are referring people appropriately uh, or taking people unnecessarily to hospital. So, um, yeah, so just a couple of ways that, that technology can help in really practical ways to join the system up on behalf of patients. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Ed, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Question. Thank you very much. Uh, Mike, shall we go with you next very quickly, if you don't mind? Thank you. Yes, yes. Um, I, I was on a top level call this morning uh, with the NHS that sustainability team, um, just sitting in and looking and, at what uh, initiatives were coming forward. And uh, there were one or two ambulance setups which actually were doing sterling work. Um, but I haven't seen anything coming from London Ambulance Service. But the things I wanted to uh, look at tonight specifically were your safety, because I'm also uh, a member of Unite at um, the a headquarters branch. Um, so, but I'm not. I'm, I'm speaking. I'm not. I'm speaking for myself. Not I'm, as as uh, speaking on behalf of Sharon. Um, I'm looking at safety, security, and recruitment. Um, safety of, of staff now is a particular real concern. It's not just about ambulance drivers, it's about a whole range of um, staff in the NHS. Um, security again goes uh, with that as well, uh, because uh, ambulance drivers may be as much uh, at risk as the police or uh, others uh, in relationship in given situations. And therefore, because there's a big dearth of recruitment in many areas at the moment, I'm just wondering how that works in relationship to the ambulance service um, in London. Yeah, so that's a um, really, really important point, Mike. Um, if, I, if, if you'll forgive me, I might just pull you up on one small yes, detail of language, please do. which is... Which is um, ambulance yeah. drivers, Mike. Be <laughs> you know, ashamed are, of yourself. We are, we are, we are clinicians, paramedics and, and clinicians that may well also drive, uh, is, uh, and, and, and in fact drive extremely well on blue lights, but that's, um, that's, that's just one of the skills in the toolbox. Um, the, um, so just, just putting up that one, but yes, yeah, so obviously safety of, um, uh, our teams is absolutely critical. And it is a problem for us. It comes up uh, all the time. Uh, I, I think the, the, the figure for the people who are, the numbers of our crews who are abused on a low level or, phys or, or physically assaulted every single day is um, shameful. And you can't, um, uh, you know, sort of to take my hat off to the people who are prepared to run to the top of a very high building um, in a difficult part of our city to look after somebody who um, may be a danger to themselves and others uh, is, you know, to, that is a massive, massive thing. And it's amazing that we've got people who are prepared to do that, frankly. Uh, so we're trying our best to make sure that uh, we are looking after the safety of our people, 
So for example, extending things like body warm, uh, body cameras, making sure that we are prosecuting people if that, um, if that happens, making sure that we are offering the appropriate um, well-being, uh, support, counselling, etc., for people who face those situations and anybody who finds themselves in a legal court situation is um, appropriately supported through that uh, that through that exercise because that may be something that they're not skilled in or they're skilled in many many things um, so it's a it's a real problem isn't it and it's part of it, it, on one level it goes with the territory on another level we can't accept it I don't know if Ed you want to give any any thoughts on that from your perspective as the person is actually doing this type of thing yeah it's a yeah, it's a it's a challenge um i don't know a colleague that hasn't been at least verbally assaulted along the way and you know many that have been physically assaulted i think the body worn cameras is a is a great introduction um and that that gives a lot of my colleagues security or some extra security should i say um, uh, I think we, uh, as an organisation, are becoming much more supportive, uh, as Roger said, of um, uh, um, prosecuting offenders. Uh, and uh, I think the team support for staff that have been assaulted um, it is definitely much better than it was when I joined. So I think we're going in the right direction with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed and, and, and Roger again, and Mike for your question. We haven't heard from Victoria. Victoria, would you like to add anything to what Roger and Ed said from throughout the meeting? Um, no, I think my colleagues have explained everything wonderfully, actually. <laughs> Excellent, well done. Well, Thank she's you. She's paid to say that. Yes. <laughs> Come on, Victoria, tell us what you really think. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I wanted really to, to use this meeting for as well as to get hopefully public's opinion on London Ambulance Services is also to see if, if you would like to appeal something to the public in terms of how they can support you and make your job easier as well, if there is a way or anything that you feel people can again can do something to, I don't know, um, make you do your job quicker and better. It may okay. Yeah, I can, I can offer you a thought on that. Um, so I was down in our emergency operations centre um, recently interviewing staff who are you'd actually the people actually answering the phones on and dispatching ambulances, et etc. And uh, we the, the big message that was coming or one of the big messages that was coming back was about the nature of calls coming in and the number of calls that they felt were inappropriate and that we were that we needed to do more to advise the public on when they should call 999 what what was going to happen when they called 999 and uh, why this person was uh, the phone was asking them lots of questions i think we've kind of all seen that why are you answering this question just send me an ambulance uh, um, and that sort of information accounts actually for the services that we interrelate with actually, such as the police and um, the people who like the buzzers at home and stuff like that. But there's something about public information. But I say that not to say that, it, uh, you know, it, 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 in a respectful way, because I recognize as well that if people aren't getting care from other bits of the system. We, we, we know that when people reach out for, or we believe that when people reach out for urgent emergency care, if they don't get an answer from the first call they make, they start to cast around and, you know, come and enter the health and care system in lots of different ways. So giving that confidence to people when they call whatever bit of the emergency care system they engage with, that their problem is going to be dealt with is really important so i'm recognizing that some of this is flowing through from that but is how do we uh advise the public on the best way to use uh the emergency system i think is a key question so that the calls land in the right place and uh and i think health watch has a absolutely role in yeah. that we'll definitely be more than happy to again 
share this information with the public and our supporters because we've done it before several times and we again really happy to do it and inform patients of, or potential patients of when to call these services. Um, yes, thank you very much, Roger. Uh, Malcolm, very quickly because we are just before 5 p.m. now. All right, okay. Um, just the, uh, you raised the issue about diversity in the London Ambulance Service. Um, it was a very white organization. I think it, it's changed very significantly in, in, in my experience of it. I mean, over the past 10 years, I think there's been major changes, but I think those changes have been less significant on, with frontline paramedics. So I think over a number of years, it went up from about 3% to about 7 or 8% uh, of frontline paramedics had a BME a heritage. And I just wonder if that is improving and what what, what more can be done to try to uh, recruit people from diverse backgrounds? Yeah, it's a great uh, thought. Thank you for, for highlighting that. So, um, so yes, you, you, the, the picture you describe is roughly still the position. Um, so, so we we know that we need to be culturally competent and uh, and and to look like the city that we serve. One, uh, we uh, if you look at ethnic diversity across our organisation, you can see that it's pretty diverse in one 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 services and some bits of the of the ambulance service, but not in the paramedic profession. Mm. That's an issue, and so. Um, Oh, we do want to try and address that. And it involves two things. One is um, trying to recruit more from within our city and the communities, um, hopefully with a, a, a move in, a, a, a coming with that is a, you know, if we're recruiting from some of the more deprived parts of our city or, or trying to promote our roles in those areas, hopefully that will have the effect that you describe. But we also have to do to address it from the other end of it, which is what are the universities doing to um, uh, to, to 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 change the makeup of the demographic makeup of, of people coming through the universities. Um, so so it's a really important challenge, and I think one that we have to address to make ourselves, you know fit for the future and uh we're, we we certainly our commitment is a hundred percent on this i think the making it work is going to be is, is going to be a graft and malcolm you suggested there that you know it's already been a 10-year mission and uh there's been some progress and there'll be more to do okay thank you very much thank you roger and roger i hope you don't mind me taking uh, the last question from rocky not at all Rocky, very quick. I'm sure there is a yeah, yeah. Just a quick Roger. I mean, I just note that um, there's a proposal to bring apprenticeship uh, medicine, medical, medical students. Is yeah. a paramedic should have an apprenticeship as well? It would be easier to recruit people through apprenticeship. Yeah. Sorry, uh, Roger. Did you want Rocky to? Shall I, shall I talk on that for a second? So we do. Yeah. We have an apprentice uh, paramedic program. So uh, it's, um, I think it's been developed in the last three years, but correct me if I'm wrong, Roger. So, um, so currently the access to become a paramedic is a, is a degree, three year degree. Um, and then that, then you follow on, then you become a newly qualified paramedic, like an NQ, like a newly qualified teacher NQT, we have NQP. And then the, there follows a, a series of two years of completing portfolio until you, um, are then a, a fully qualified band six paramedic. So yeah. that's one access into becoming a paramedic, but the, we also recognize that internal training is a really important pathway. And some people that um, may have missed uh, steps along the way to be able to complete a degree. We also recognize that getting a degree has a financial implication for a lot of people and is beyond their means. So um, we've got a, we have got an apprentice paramedic program. We also have uh, lots of other grades of clinical staff, uh, emergency medical technicians, um, as long as our, uh, uh, as well as our um, uh, apprentices. Uh, and these staff will be taken on with uh, medical training performed uh, in-house with the uh, London Ambulance Service. And then over a period of years, they will be able to upskill 
internally or via our partner university university of cumbria to be able to qualify as paramedics so we are we are very much in favor of that as a an internal training route as well as the degree uh, route yeah in fact we're one of the biggest providers of apprenticeships in the world, I think I'm right, so. we are indeed. thank you Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for staying two minutes after five. Uh, Roger, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Ed and Victoria, for you as well. well I mean, what, well, can I just say thank you to yeah. you all for your contributions and challenges? It's been really, really helpful. Thank uh, one. You. Uh, two, we've been listening to what you've asked us, what you've thought was important. So we'll reflect on all of that. And I'm hoping to get the um uh, some form of letter from uh from from, from you from you and health watch hackney to uh tell us kind of what you want to see in our strategy as well and uh um so i look forward to receiving that um so just an opportunity to just kind of quiz hopefully this conversation has been uh informative with with defining that and um you know if it's transparency if it's um making sure we have a diverse workforce all of the all of the things that we've discussed in this meeting making sure we're making use of technology um you know the uh, uh making sure we're looking after the safety of our staff the things that you've all highlighted um during this meeting today you know please do put that down and send it to us formally as part of this exercise that would be fantastic Sure, will do. Thank you very much, Roger. Thank you all for joining and for asking wonderful questions and as ever. Um, have a good evening and um, we'll be in touch again. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.